and welcome to Stella Journeys. My name is Kat and this is Ash. The team here at SFC Films have created this show to help us look beyond our immediate environment and out to the stars. It's about learning how much we can achieve beyond our own tiny corner of the galaxy. It can be scary to feel this small, but also beautiful to know we are all in this together and can achieve remarkable things. In today's episode, we'll be looking at the beginning of space exploration. For thousands of years, humans have used the stars of the night sky to understand the world around us. The stars tell us stories. They signify the changing seasons and have helped humanity to navigate. As technology increased, so did humanity's interest and belief that someday we may venture out beyond our speck of dust. And that journey began with Sputnik. If we're all the firsts in space, the first man in space, the first female in space, the first American astronaut in space, and the first spacewalk. We, that is the human species, need to first put stuff into space. But as they say, rocket science is hard. However, when we learned how to send rockets up into space and into orbit, it was time to send satellites up there. Something that was the spark to start a journey into space. Enter the launch of Sputnik. On October 1957, Sputnik orbited the Earth for about 98 minutes, and its function was only to transmit a few blips while in space. But this was a pivotal moment in history for space exploration. It is often referred to as the start of the space age. But what did Sputnik really achieve? From an engineering and scientific perspective, it was a tremendous achievement. It not only proved that rocket engineering can be used for something peaceful, but also the tremendous potential for space exploration. However, during the Cold War and the political environment at the time, this event started what is now referred to as a space race between Russia and United States of America. The first successful American satellite was Explorer 1, which was launched in January 1958. And later that year, NASA was formed. The rivalry of Russia and the United States of America may not have been the best of motives for humans going to space, but it did achieve several things, including the political will to increase the resources and research into space and space exploration. It led to John F. Kennedy's declaration. But I do say that space can be explored and mastered without feeding the fires of war, without repeating the mistakes that man has made in extending his writ around this globe of ours. There is no strife, no prejudice, no national conflict in outer space as yet. Its hazards are hostile to us all. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind. And its opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. What a wonderful speech. And that was the spark for a new race to the moon. And it all started with a little silver ball orbiting the Earth. So we'd managed to get things into space. But what about people? Getting people into space was a defining moment in world history. Let's go to Stuart to tell us all about it. For young people now, I expect the moon landing is, like World War II, simply ancient history. Something their grandfather or father witnessed, but distinct and far from the living history of today. Luckily for us, I'm here to interview someone who witnessed and lived through the moon landing, Skylab, and the space race of the late 60s and 70s. Myself. Thank you, Mr. Bullock, for agreeing to this interview. Thank you, Stuart. I'm always glad to be here. And please call me Stuart. What do you remember about the 60s? My earliest memories begin around 1968. I recall Beatles songs on the radio and that young children at school had short hair, but the young men of the day had long hair. 
Oh, I miss my hair. Ignore your hair, Stuart. At Christmas in 1968, the Apollo 8 mission circled the moon without landing. Oh, yes. I remember my mum talking about it, and it was on the news. We had black and white TV in those days, and not everyone had one. They were the size of cabinets. The astronauts were Frank Borman, William Anders, and Jane Lovell. Lovell commanded the later Apollo 13. But my very first memory, of course, is Apollo 11. History recounts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins being launched to the moon on the 21st of July 1969 and Neil Armstrong becoming the first person to step on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Between 1969 and 1972, NASA continued to propel men to the moon like shooting peas from a pipe. In all, 10 Apollo missions were planned, but only 7 happened. The last was Apollo 17. Apollos 8 to 20 were cancelled due to budgetary constraints and partly due to the success of their predecessors. During the 70s, there are a number of other standout events. ABBA, for instance. We went through flared trousers, glam rock and disco to punk rock, long hair to short hair. And aside from that, many of my age became enthralled by the space race. For me, there were four key events. Pioneers 11 and 10, Skylab, Viking 1 and 2, and Voyager 1 and 2. In November 1973, Pioneer passed by Jupiter and we saw the red spot up close. Between 1973 and 74, the first space station, Skylab, was occupied by crews called in turn Skylab 2, 3, and finally Skylab 4. Skylab was the forerunner of today's space station. Astronauts lived for up to three months in space and did all manner of experiments, but most of it was beyond the general public. What wasn't though was the zero gravity toilet. Again, a teenage boy and potty humor. What could possibly go wrong? Fun fact, it took about two and a half hours to set up for a single shower, but as Paul Veit said, at least you came out smelling good. In 2018, I came across the Skylab Museum at Balladonia, which claimed to have an actual debris. Hopefully, here's a picture of me next to what I dub the world's largest ream hot water tank. And what about 1976 with the Viking landing on Mars? What do you remember about them? I remember seeing the first images of Mars and thinking they were super bright red. I thought the Martian landscape looked even more alien than the grey one of the moon. Of course, Viking took samples looking for signs of life past or present. Then there were the Voyager missions. They remain one of the most successful space exploration endeavors of all time. Stuart? Yes, Voyager 1 was launched on the 20th of August, 1979. But this was four days after the death of Elvis Presley. So press coverage about it was little to none. Everyone talked about Elvis and if he was truly dead or just faking it. Voyager 1 gave us close images of Jupiter and Saturn and Saturn's moon Titan. What do you remember about them? I remember Voyager 2, although launched earlier, took a longer route and passed by Jupiter and Saturn. But I remember the photos of Uranus and Neptune more than Saturn or Jupiter. But this time we'd seen Jupiter, so it wasn't news, but Neptune was. It was a cool electric blue. Both of these are craft are now in interstellar space. But if they're ever found by an alien civilization, we've put our calling cards on each of them. Each Voyager has a golden disc. And what's funny is they're already old-fashioned LP records. And I suspect there are a lot of young people who've never seen a record player and may wonder why the discs have a hole in them. Yes, I imagine the aliens might be wondering that too. But so far you've mentioned the American programs. What about the other countries? Yes, we're in a Cold War with the Soviets. So a lot of press was biased to the US. One thing I remember was the docking between Apollo and Soyuz spacecraft. That was in 1975, and at the time it seemed hopeful, but others were skeptical. I remain hopeful, and this was proved true later with the collaboration between Russia and America. Thank you very much for your time, Stuart. I know you're a busy man. You can see your way out. Thank you. Always a pleasure. And here's where I depart. In the decade 1968 to 1978, I witnessed people walk on the moon, live in space, probes flung to the outer solar system and beyond. I saw sideburns, bad fashion, but I also welcomed changes. But I saw it through the lens of a student from primary school until year 10. It's amazing to me that Stuart grew up with that defining such a big part of his childhood. For me, what defined my interest in space was definitely going out camping with my family and watching the stars overhead. 
Ash, what was your kind of defining space moment? Yeah, great question. So for me, I remember going down the coast with my best mate and looking up at the night sky through his telescope and just seeing how little we all were in the scheme of things. It was a beautiful moment to look out and see what there was to discover. And I've been hooked ever since then. Where the race and competition started our trek into space, it would soon become about much more than that. The start of this journey was not just about technology, but for the first time, we were able to see Earth from another planetary body. Join us in the next episode as we look at the shuttle era and the future of space travel. See you, see you next time. time.